I guess people will join in as we as we go. I'll have to uh, manually approve them actually, but that's fine. Okay. All right, guys. So uh, first, I want to say that. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for uh, to our dean and to our uh, program chair that allowed this uh, this class to be uh, open to public. And it's not just you, my students of the visual communication now, but also um, anybody on and off the university. So um, it's uh, it's a very nice chance to get. Uh, prospective students for AUA and um, this is uh, and it's also a subject of a class is very uh, very dear to me and very interesting I grew up on this material it's something that I um, I loved from uh, from very early on so um, I'm happy for this chance to share this with you all right so <laughs> like I said Today's uh, class is dedicated to ancient Mesopotamia. And we'll also talk a little bit about how the writing was uh, in fact invented in Shumer. And it's a, a, a fascinating story on its own and uh, you'll be surprised, but it is connected to us, to Armenians. Um, this on its own is already a, a, a fascinating fact. But before that, let us just uh, for a second talk about what was and how why was why was it called uh, Mesopotamia? So it's the land between the two rivers. Can anybody name those two rivers? Which rivers are we talking about here? Euphrates. Yeah, and the second one. Tigris. Tigris, correct. So the land between the two rivers, and here some about 5,000 years ago, Sumerians developed world's earliest true civilization from the roots that extend back into the dimness of prehistory. Now, Kenneth Clark, uh, who studied this phenomenon of civilization, but and also published a wonderful book on it, uh, based on which BBC produced a TV series, series, very successful TV series, once said that the history of civilization is not the history of art and far from it. So the great works can be produced in barbarous societies. In fact, the very narrowness of the primitive society gives ornamental art a chance to excel. Now you, you have heard me before that I don't like using the term primitive or barbarous because neither term sounds right to me. I don't think those, uh, those societies were barbarous or primitive, but he's all, Clark of course speaks from the point of view of the classical civilization and uh, uh, he makes a valid point. So of course the art we produce depend on the, on the tools that we use and clearly at the at, at the very early time, humanity didn't simply didn't have the the tools to produce uh, very sophisticated forms of art, but that of course changed over the time. So, starting with 3000 BC, uh, a flourishing civilization existed on these lower banks of two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, and the two people, two kind of people, inhibit inhabit that that land, those were the Akkadians and the Shumerians. By the way, those two rivers, both Tigris and Euphrates start in Armenian highland and flow toward the Persian Gulf. So uh, both of them and, and these rivers were navigatable at the ancient time. Euphrates still is. So we can, we can already from the fact that geographically Armenian highland is connected to, the, to Mesopotamia uh, already signifies uh, the, the close connections that we had with the, with the Shumer and the Kat. Now, this is the first time that people were, uh, the loyalty of the people were no longer 
uh, to the tribe or a clan, but to the community as a whole. So these were the first urban centers with rich and complex and uh, varied life. And here lofty ziggurats rose skywards, filling the citizen's heart with all wonder and pride. Um, it was here that where art and technological ingenuity, industrial specialization, commercial enterprise found room to grow and expand. And this distinctive pottery that the Shumerians used had connections to Iran to the east, but has also been found on the Arabian side of the Persian Gulf. And eventually it spread to the, uh, into what is now Northern Iraq and Syria. And pottery for us is, is a very important uh, tool to examine the intercultural connections between different parts of the world and pottery in Mesopotamia is uh, found in abundance. And here, just look at this. Is a, this is a beaker from Shusha, and do, do not confuse the Shusha with our Shushi. These are two very different uh, places. Asian Shusha lies very, very near to the Arabian Gulf. It's right down to the river, and um, it has got nothing to do with Shushi that we know. Now it's it's this this beaker it painted very boldly and fluidly with this schematic yet remarkably lively animal in pure silhouette. You see these dogs running on a, on the top, and you have this frieze of very long necked birds at the top, uh, running dogs and ibex with the huge horns. So you see, with such simplicity, the artist is capable of passing the animality of the of the animal and be so expressive uh, without really resorting to much detail. Now, but perhaps the most important thing that it was uh, uh, the fact that in Mesopotamia and early cities, a practical system of writing was first developed and it brought about a revolution in communication. And it had such a far reaching effects on man, economic, intellectual and cultural progress. Now, from 2900 BC, this pictorial signs start to be impressed on a, in wet clay with a reed stylus, and they make the uh, wedge-shaped marks, which are now known as the cuneiform. So this is the, the script that is in question now. Now, by means of writing, man is able to overcome time, space, and complexity, because written documents hand down knowledge of the earlier ages, and it also builds a, a rich and substantial intellectual heritage for far beyond what oral tradition can do. Um, and I want you to take a look at this object here and tell me, do you see anything that, that any symbolism of in, in any of the um, elements here, what could this possibly be? What do you see here? Sorry. Animals facing right. Okay, animals are facing right. What what kind of animals do you see here? A scorpion. Oh, you see a scorpion. That... A turtle. This there is a turtle. There is a turtle right here. Yeah. There is... do you see the snake going just right yeah. on the edge? Yeah. Yes, and there's mm -hmm. of course this these three symbols here on top. Yeah. We could guess that one of this, them is the sun, the other one is the moon. Isn't this the symbol of Shamash, like sun god? Yeah, yeah. So this is, what you see here is the Babylonian um, boundary stone. Uh, it, called, it was called Kuduru, and it depicts symbols of the gods and goddesses as witness to a legal agreement, basically. So it was usually originally kept in a temple, but then a clay copy could be made to, uh, of the contract that would be given to the landowner to use as a boundary stone. And you remember last class, I told you about the Egyptians actually using mathematics to, to uh, measure distance because of the flooded delta of, of Nile. So again, writing comes at the crucial point to solve a, a, a real problem, a real life problem. 
how to record information. Now Egyptians were, uh, we, we spoke about the Rosetta Stone and, and hieroglyphs and uh, uh, that emerged from the preliterate uh, artistic tradition of Egypt. And like I said, if you remember, the bo both cuneiform and hieroglyphic writing took uh, a similar uh, course development over approximately the same period of time in the ancient history, but we have to uh, um, say that the consensus is that the Sumerians did it first. So it was, they were just a little bit earlier, they started to address this, uh, this problem of how to record information. Now letters overcome distance in space and allow central control of the remote dependencies. A writing serves to organize and retain myriads of detailed facts. So as we see the accounting was actually the, the main reason for which writing was developed. And the technique was simple and may I say ingenious because all you needed is basically a stylus and a, and a piece of clay of which you would, what would you do? You would um, uh, make a dent for each animal or, or an object that needed to be counted and then make a simplified drawing uh, what was counted next to them. So this is how you would identify how many objects or animals have been counted. That was a, oh, oh, a simple logic. Yes? Was this used in trade, like to understand like? Of course it was in to use. Count in trade. It wasn't just used in trade, it was, uh, uh, it, 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 be, it was essential for the human survival basically. Before people, I can imagine that people would get into a lot of trouble trying to say, you know, I had 10 sheep, but my neighbor actually stole two and now I'm missing two. But here I have a proof, you know, I put it on clay. I recorded the, the fact that I had. Uh, yes, Sona, you, you are eager to say something? Uh, yes, actually, they were also used uh, to, uh, to count uh, how many things are there in warehouses. Yeah, and uh, and the reason that uh, they wrote kind of sideways the symbols is because at first they were writing it like a list from up to uh, from top to bottom, yeah. uh, but then it was smudging. It wasn't convenient because uh, the clay was smudging, yeah. and that's why they started writing left to right. But then it was weird for the reader to understand, so they switched, flipped it ninety degrees, and started writing like that. All right. All right, accepted. Now we have to um, we have to say that of course uh, the development of cuneiform took time. In the beginning, uh, the technique of writing was different, like Sona mentioned. So it took about six hundred years until the cuneiform became to its like consistent form, and the curves were eliminated, and the signs became simplified, uh, and the direct connection between the look of the pictograms and the original object of reference was lost. That's a, that's a fact. Now, with writing came literature and, uh, and the Sumerians had a lit literature of some quality for it includes the Epic of Gilgamesh, which still more than 4,000 years later has the power to move us. Uh, a Sumerian epic it contains an account uh, which re relates to the invention of writing and it is known among the modern scholars as Enmerkar and the Lord of Arata. Now, this is a very interesting uh, piece of history uh, which, uh, which is surprisingly, uh, might surprise many of you and the connection between in the, actually the involvement of Armenians in the creation of writing. Now, um, I don't need probably to, uh, to explain that Arata, which is mentioned in, uh, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, is most definitely Ararat and most definitely refers to uh, the Ar Armenian highland. Like I said, of course, the Tigris and the Euphrates there were two rivers that originated in Armenian highland and the communication between Shumer and ancient Mesopotamia and Armenia was intense. Uh, but what, was, uh, uh, what actually happened? Because it is recorded 
And the Epic of Gilgamesh was found, the clay tablets were found and translated. So we can really know what, what actually, what does it say? Now, according to the poem, Emerkar, he was the second ruler of the first dynasty of Uruk. He sent a messenger to Arata, which is a remote city. It says it is a city, but I, don't, I, I, I suppose it is more referring to a country. And uh, that was yeah, separated from Uruk by seven great mountains. And what he actually wanted, he demanded the people of Arata to bring gold, silver, uh, precious stones, etc., to and build him various shrines and temples. That was the demand of the Enmerkar, the king in Uruk, in Shumer. Now he wanted those raw materials and precious stones. So he, de he decided to make Arata a vessel state. Not, but not by, by means of military expedition, but of war of nerves, uh, the very first kind in human history. So what did he do? He sent a messenger. He followed, uh, he followed the advice that was given to him by Inanna, the protective goddess of the city. He sent an eloquent messenger to Arata to deliver his demand and threat by repeating what he said to the Armenian, to Armenian, I'll call him Armenian because he was Armenian, because it is Arata and Arata is Ararat, verbatim. So verbally passed the message uh, to the Armenian king and refusing to submit, no wonder, our, the Lord of Arata raised each time a prerequisite condition for his subjugation that seemed impossible to meet. Now the messenger had to go back and forth playing the role of the verbal transmitter between the two kings. So the, the, uh, the battle of words became more, and fe more fierce and the content of the messages more complicated. So the messenger became linguistically overwhelmed. He could no longer pass the message. <laughs> I imagine it also took some time for him to go back and forth between um, Shumer and, uh, and Arata. So what, 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 what did he do? And this is the actual passage in Gilgamesh that talks about that. Uh, this is the, the, the past, this passage generally regard, regarded as the Shumerian account for the invention of, of writing. And the writing medium was clay. And then Merkar was the inventor. So he took a piece of clay and he wrote down the message that he wanted the messenger to pass to the king of Arata. Now, Naturally, we would assume that if you write something, you presume that the person is gonna read it will be able to understand it. So there is some discrepancy here from my point of view on that, of course, if this was the first time that something was, uh, first time the markings were made, made on clay, uh, and this is the recording, the beginning of writing, um, we should assume that the king of Arata was able to actually read what the Shumerian king was writing, unless, of course, it was it was meant to upset him even more, because this was became actually uh, the first war of nerves in 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 history. Interesting, right? I uh, this is surprising that uh, Arata uh, Ararat had some role to play in, in the invention of writing. Now the empire that succeeded Shumer was Assyria and the modern discovery of Assyrian history was one of the greatest achievements in archeology. span Now there were spectacular finds in ancient cities of Nineveh and Babylon that prompted more extensive excavation and study, which gradually produced a picture of one of, one of, one of the world's lost civilizations. Assyria was a militaristic state, and its great days, most, in, in its great days, was the most successful imperial power of the world has ever seen. Now, uh, as it, because they were militaristic, so they were uh, engaged in developing all sorts of weaponry and uh, they used many different types of chariots uh, that were two-wheeled and 
uh, open backed vehicles drawn by one or more horses. And you can see on this relief an example of that. Now, Assyrians love to hunt. And when an Assyrian king was not on a campaign, on military campaign, or directing a building project, he was usually in the field ha hunting animals. At that time in Syria, a Syrian plain was filled with uh, elephants and lions and wild bulls. Uh, and it was the favorite district for the royal hunt. And now this piece is the royal hunt, a famous royal hunt of Ashurbanipal is the most famous uh, in, in the ancient history. And uh, these are the Assyrian reliefs from a uh, North Palace of Nineveh. And they are on display in British Museum. Now they are widely regarded as the supreme masterpieces of Assyrian art. Uh, now about the religion, a Babylonian influence on uh, Assyrian religion was immense. And the two gods from the South, Marduk and Nabu were very popular in Assyria. And of course, because Assyria inherited uh, a territory of Shumer for most part, it also inherited the gods and inherited the religion that was emanating from there. So there were Shumerian gods, mysterious gods, Anunnaki, they were called, An, Enlil, Enki, Nihursak, Nana, Anutu, and Inanna, they were worshipped and uh, their, presses, their presence extended beyond the uh, Mesopotamia. It reached as far as the Armenian Plateau. Uh, interestingly, two of the names of the Sumerian gods uh, ring very similar to us because Utu was the god of sun is uh, in Armenian can be related to Ut, the number Ut, which is number eight, that uh, in its shape uh, resembles the movement of the sun in the sky. So this is the trajectory of the sun in the sky. Uh, and um, interesting fact that uh, the close relationship between Shumer and Armenia certainly left, uh, left a mark on, on both, both Shumer, and both Armenian. Um, so about a little bit about magic. Um, the popular religion took a form of magic, a sorcery, and the literature that was discovered in Assyrian libraries contain, contains numerous incantations. Now these cylinder seals, they were first used in Mesopotamia and they served as a mark of ownership or identification. Now, seals are important to the study of the ancient Near Eastern art because many examples survive from every period and can therefore help to define chronological phases of development. Now, often preserving, preserving imagery no longer extant in any other medium, they serve as a visual chronicle of style and iconography. Now, this seal shows uh, a scorpion man and a male figure wearing a long garment, garment thanking a deity standing on a winged lion. And the goddess Ishtar is also represented. You see there is a little sign here I want you to pay attention to because I'll ask you about this in a, a little bit later. This one right here. So uh, it's a winged sun disk. Now, for people living in the ancient Iraq and imperial peripheries in Syria, Anatolia, and Iran, during the first millennium BC, magic was a part of everyday life. Uh, far from being considered irrational, uh, it was the guiding principle by which Mesopotamian understood various natural phenomena and their positive and negative consequences. Um, for example, the Silesian omens could reveal the Assyrian king to be in imminent danger or to have fortunate circumstances in war. A magic could be used to combat the negative uh, actions of ghosts, demons, and human sorcerers. It, it could protect against uh, the curse that resulted from unknown, unknowingly committing a sin and thus losing the favor of the one's personal god or goddess. 
So they took that into account too. So you can commit a sin without being conscious of that. Now our responsibilities of the uh, Mesopotamian magician could come under umbrella of, of number of specialties, such as magical, scientific, medical, literary, and religious. Uh, our knowledge of these practices comes from the extensive cuneiform record that, pre that preserves the description of these specialists, their technical knowledge, the spells they recited, and the medical substances they used and made, and, and the knowledge necessary to interpret signs uh, in a natural world. Under the direction of the Assyrian kings, many of these spells and practices became standardized and the texts were formalized into several canonical series referred to as handbooks. Many of them, uh, uh, many were recovered from the famous library of Ashur, Ashurbanipal in Nineveh and from the city of Sippar, one of the great Mesopotamian centers of learning that are in displays in museum in Iraq. Now, in addition to text and ritual practices, there were objects that worked alongside or in the, independently of textual traditions. Images were believed to have inlived and capable of acting on their own independent wills. So these Lama Su, these massive winged composite creatures with the head of a man and the body of a bull or a lion guarded gateways to throne rooms and other important spaces and routes throughout palace complexes. From the front, these creatures appear as steadfast guardians of what could be a potentially fragile or significant threshold. And from the side, the creative execution of the legs gives the illusion of a striding beast ready to move against any metaphysical enemy. The account of the archaeologist who excavated and saw for the first time the Limassol was, was interesting because he was shocked by, by this giant figure, uh, did not anticipate in any way that if you just move aside, it feels that the creature steps forward. So uh, this was an optical illusion that the uh, Mesopotamian artists employed. Um, so multivalent powers of these supernatural creatures were meant to bolster and protect the king's reign. Now what happened with the cuneiform decipherment? Now earliest attempts were largely unsuccessful until in 1835 Henry R Rawlinson, a British officer, correctly deducted the phonetic language of the old, uh, phonetic nature of the old Persian and successfully deciphered uh, based on inscription of the King Darius I. I'll speak about the, the Achaemenid Empire in a second. So the inscription is the same story like with the, uh, that happened with the Rosetta Stone that had hieroglyphs on it, a demotic writing and Greek. So, this inscription was also trilingual and it consisted of three identical texts of the official languages of the Achaemenid Empire, Old Persian, Assyrian, and Elamite. So by 1851, about 200 Babylonian signs could be read and the decipherment of the Akkadian cuneiform was accomplished. The same time the library of Ashurbanipal was excavated, discovered and excavated and the Royal Archive consisting of thousands of clay tablets and cuneiform inscriptions helped to shed light on, on, on the history of, uh, of Assyria. Now, all of the Mesopotamian civilizations, Shumer, Akkad, Babylon, Hittites, Elamites, and Assyrians used cuneiform, and the use of which was not limited to the Fertile Crescent and extended first to the north to the Armenian highlands. So we also use them. And like I mentioned in the last class, we have cuneiform inscriptions in Van. We have cuneiform inscriptions in, in, in Arabunia and in different locations in Armenia, different stelas. Boundary stones were also found with cuneiform inscription of the Urartian kings. Now we come to the Achaemenid Empire. Now, this is the third wave. So if you look at the, at the history of the ancient Mesopotamia, 
The first were the Shumerians and the Akkadians, then Assyrians replaced them. And the third wave was the, the Persians, uh, which established the Achaemenid Empire. How? Now in the Iron Age, there were two ethnic groups, the Medes and the Persians. There were also other Iranian ethnic groups. They gradually moved into and became the dominant force in the Western half of the Iranian plateau. Now both Medes and, and Persians are mentioned in the Neo-Assyrian cuneiform sources by the ninth century BC. Now early in the millennium, the Medes apparently controlled the whole of the East, Eastern uh, Zargos mountain reg region. You can see it in this photograph. It's right there in the right corner. Uh, and uh, were soon, soon pushing westward in the places uh, of the edge of the Mesopotamian lowlands. The Persians were found in two locations, first in the central west and then further south in Fars. Now much of the story of the, uh, of the myths told, told by Herodotus is legend, but a good deal of it is actual history. So the last Median king, uh, Astyages, was overthrown by a rise, of, a rise to power in Iranian world of Cyrus II of Persia and Achaemenid. Now it was him just, just uh, justly called the Great who unified for the first time several Persian and Iranian groups and established the Achaemenid empire, which fell two centuries later to the conquest of another man with the great in his name, and that was Alexander. So in religion, in religion, the Iranians were orig originally uh, polytheists where gods were associated with natural phenomena and abstract concepts. But then there was around 600 BC, there was the great ethical prophet Zoroaster uh, who preached in Northern Iran and his message greatly changed Iranian religion. He upheld the need for men to act righteously and speak the truth and reject the lie. His religion was essential, essentially a dualism in, in that he stressed the eternal conflict between truth and lie and abstract conceptions which became almost personifications. So it was a dualistic religion and uh, neither rejecting or approving uh, of, the, of these forces that naturally exist in the world, that the light, light and darkness, truth and light, etc. So the Zoroastrian religion was built based on those uh, sometimes abstract concepts, yeah. And the Achaemenid art, like religion, was a blend of many elements. All the peoples of the empire was, were marshaled by the great king to help create imperial art worthy of Achaemenid power and wealth. Now the two Achaemenid empires in their homeland, Fars, uh, Pasargade and Persop Persepolis, uh, in there one can trace almost every architectural and decorative detail to a foreign origin. Interesting. Yet the conception and the plan of the two cities and their buildings is entirely new in the history of art. Well, Persepolis, primary, it was, it was a, uh, as a city, was the primary creation of the Darius I and Asursus, uh, remains one of the most remarkable monuments of the ancient Western Asia. Now tastes and styles and motives and, uh, and techniques were blended together in eclectic art, which itself reflected the Persian concept of an empire where pe people were generally left to their own beliefs, customs and tastes. That was, uh, that was important to, to mention, right? So Persians were, had many different influences coming emanating from Egypt and from India and from, from, from Greece. Nevertheless, they were able to assimilate all those influences and, uh, and create eclectic art that was entirely theirs. 
So the sum of the parts is Persian, not Greek, not Babylonian, not Elamite or Egyptian. That was a, that was a unique phenomenon. The, and the ultimate achievement of the Achaemenids was to, to have ruled with creative tolerance over disparate, disparate, disparate peoples and cultures for over 200 years. They managed to do that. They managed not to suppress so much that would, co that would cause uh, an uprising, an uh, incessant civil, civil, civil strife. They managed this empire with, uh, with a very good political sensitivity and cultural tolerance. That's important to be said. Now, some say that the ancient world ended when uh, Cyrus marched on Babylon, and others argue that it was that he died when Alexander burned Persepolis. In either case, it's clear that the Achaemenid Empire contributed to crucial developments in art, philosophy, literature, religion, historiography, exploration, economics, science, and politics. And that provided the immediate background for the further, further changes which were to follow in the Hellenistic age. Now, there was also another culture worth to mention that uh, physically lies closer to Armenia and that, that was the Hittite civilization. They were our neighbor state to the Southwest. Uh, they also used, uh, next to cuneiform, they used a rich logographic script. Uh, it's also sometimes called Anatolian hieroglyphic script. It consisted for over about 500 signs. Now, unlike, unlike the contemporary Middle Eastern people in Mesopotamia and Egypt, Hittites did not have, did not live in a great river valley, and therefore they did not have the benefit of large scale, highly productive irrigation ag agriculture which, on which to build their civilization. But they did benefit from what was cultural, what was cultural influences coming in from Mesopotamia and Egypt via Syria. And it, had, it was these influences which enabled them to build their own civilization. Um, now, the language of the Anatolian hieroglyphic script uh, proved to be Luvian and not Hittite. And on their seals at times, both hieroglyphic and cuneiform was used, which makes it apparent that both, both systems were used uh, simultaneously. Now, origins of the uh, Hittite or hieroglyphic writing remains obscure. But there are external similarities to Cretan pictographic writing, which indicate not a direct borrowing of any kind, but some sort of idea fusion or fusion. So some academics be, uh, believe that um, your heated hieroglyphic writing comes from Egyptian hieroglyphs. However, in neither case, a conclusive evidence uh, can uh, conclusive, conclusive influence cannot be established between the two scripts. There is a possibility, however, that the Hittite hieroglyphic writing was an ingenious creation, indigenous creation, perhaps inspired by the Egyptian and uh, Cretan scripts. Now, like I said in the beginning, and this story of Gilgamesh uh, epic and the connection between Shumer and Armenian Plateau. Uh, I'll just say a few more things about that. And now, um, some of you may, uh, may ask, where Urartu, Urartians, Armenians or not? Because we keep hearing this term Urartu, Urartu, but then wonder whether um, we're talking on, about our ancestors. Are these the same people? Is this the same ethnos as Armenians? And let me tell you um, at least what I believe. Now, Armenian and Urartu are synonymous. Now, in the trilingual, trilingual uh, inscription in Behistun of Darius the Great, the Babylonian toponym Urashtu appears in Old Persian as Armina, and in, in Elamite as Harminuia, and it 
corresponding to the modern Armenia. Now in Hebrew, as recorded in Bible, this land was called Ararat. Urartu therefore, by all means, um, I believe is the, you know, there is this interesting thing, right? The name of the geographic region commonly used as the exonym for the Iron Age Kingdom, also known by the modern rendition of, the, of its endonym, the Kingdom of Van, Van centered around the Lake Van in the Armenian highlands. So there was the question, how do we call ourselves? How do we call ourselves and how others call us? So uh, when we say Armenia, we don't call Armenia Armenia. Yeah, we call it Hayastan, although I'm not very fond of using Stan uh, as, as a root uh, because there is also Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan and many other Stans. And I think our country would, uh, would probably be better off if we would have a name that did not have uh, this external um, root in it. We, we have beautiful names. We could call our country Ararat, how the same way it was called uh, at the time of, of or Arata, uh, that was the time of Shumer and, uh, uh, and the Achaemenid Empire. So there is, uh, for you, let there be no confusion. Uh, Urartu is Armenia, it's not, uh, an alien entity or a kingdom that has got nothing to do with us. One of the reasons why this in academic circles, it was very, very much promoted to separate Urartu, and I'm speaking about the Soviet times, to separate Urartu from Ararat and from Armenia was the fact that then the Soviet academics would have to admit that the Armenian history extends back not to the Behistun inscription of Darius, but thousands and thousands of years further. And, and that they did not apparently feel very comfortable with that. So this thesis of Urartu being something else other than Armenia was promoted. And, and the pictorial writing in Armenia goes back to the very early times and perhaps to the new stone age. And uh, the proof of that is this uh, large amount of the pictograms or petroglyphs that are carved on rocks and cliff uh, faces that, and they depict uh, stylized human and animal figures. Um, th this served as a as means of communication as well as of ritual and artistic expression. Now, if any one of you have ever been in Gerama Mountains beyond, beyond the Lake Sevan, you would have hundreds of meters of stones aligned uh, on the same path with these incredible uh, drawings. These are drawings, these are not letters yet. These are drawings that uh, with time became uh, hieroglyphic script that we used. Very interestingly, that that script, um, and this of course is an example of the uh, Sarduri II, the king of, of Urartu, well, I'll still use that term, um, and it's in Van, in Western Armenia. So this is cuneiform. But interesting what happened with the, with the hieroglyphic script. Now, what we did, we developed uh, the hieroglyphic script into a coherent system. And uh, well, eventually it was replaced by cuneiform that were uh, modeled on Assyrian prototypes. But it's interesting that with the rise of Christianity in Armenia, the hieroglyphic script was banned and pursued as a product of pagan culture. But in spite of this, it continues to exist in form of magic signs, signatures of Armenian craftsmen and the coins of uh, Kilikian Armenian kings. And also many of them, many of these signs are found along with explanations in Armenian medieval manuscripts. Now their presence in Hamail's, the magical scrolls, the Armenian magical scrolls is a testimony that some late Iron Age signs where and probably still are in the use among the Armenians. This is fascinating because this, we, we have hieroglyphic writing 
which is not fully deciphered. I think we don't know the end of it. It's like a rabbit hole. You know, more you dive into it, more more things you discover. And to just to 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 support what I just said, uh, I'll I'll give you a little example. When Matenadaran decided to publish um, a souvenirs that would contain Hamail, some and Hamail is a term we use for the Armenian magical uh, scripts. They send a team of ethnographers to the Armenian villages, asking you know, to collect the samples of Hamail scripts uh, for them to be able to, to copy them. Uh, and people refused. People refused to give them up under any circumstances. And that actually, uh, in my eyes, at least to me, proves that we still use them and we still believe in their power. Now, many of you, of course, have heard the term Tuhtugir. Now, Tuhtugir, this is a simplified way of, of, of describing this tradition. By the way, the roots of which go deep into Mesopotamia. These are, this is a tradition that came to us from Mesopotamia. Um, the matter of the fact is that we, it's largely remains unstudied. And, uh, and I, uh, we have to wait until probably a new generation of scholars would take this subject on uh, more seriously and try to study it to, to the large extent. Right now, there are thousands of manuscripts in Matanadaran that have not been studied and that contain this quite incredible signs. Now, if you look at it, they look like sometimes, I, I don't know how to, to describe them, them. Some of them look like Arabic numbers. Some of them look like drawings. For example, this one certainly could be an animal. What is this sign doing on a page of the medieval Armenian manuscript is, uh, is a mystery to me. There are many, many, many. And, um, you know, I'm a calligrapher, so I like letter forms. And, uh, and it was tempting to me to copy these drawings, but then something was like instinctively, I felt that I should not be meddling with this sort of stuff because I do not understand what's written. So if you copy something that you don't understand, you might <laughs> cause a disaster if you believe in this sort of things. But anyway, I, I, I refrained from, from, from doing that too much. I just the only thing that I've done, I compiled this, uh, uh, this example, uh, we have a term for it. It's called Nishanagiri must nots. And uh, some of these signs that you see here are over 10,000 year old. So this class was important for us to examine the connection between ancient Mesopotamia and, and Armenia. Also to know, you know, what, uh, how actually the uh, the story of writing has begun and Shumerans uh, had an account for it, which we uh, had a chance to take a very brief because we can't go too much into it within the limits of the 50 minutes that we have for the class. So this, this is all we could, uh, all time we could uh, give to it. Now guys, I, um, uh, since I have another class coming up in 10 minutes, Unfortunately, I do not have time to answer anything, anything more than one or two questions, if you might have. But if you do, go ahead. Uh, and if you don't, then uh, I'll bid you goodbye and I'll see you then on Monday. Uh, your assignment for the weekend is going to be uploaded to Moodle in, in when I finish the second class. It's going to be about Egypt and Egyptian art. And I hope that the class that we had inspired you to, um, uh, to, to study a, a little bit, to go a little bit deeper into, into ancient Egypt and the fascinating uh, culture uh, full of beautiful art. And your assignment is to tell the story of, of that art. Um, again, the deadline is gonna be on Monday, uh, the beginning of your class on Monday. 
So if you have any questions, go ahead. And if not, we'll end this here. Yes, um, I have a question. I'm sorry, sure, I just ahead. have a class after this. Um, so I got enrolled a little late um, to this class, as you know. So whenever I saw the deadline for the assignment was like an hour later, I, I just saw the description um, on the assignment number one. Yeah. And then you told me to redo it. Now I'm looking at the um, now I'm looking at the lecture for that yeah. um, assignment, and it, um, it says we have to do the first two pages of the introduction, and then and then go on um, into the, mm, the an analysis part. Yeah. So that I wanted to ask you just mentioned that assignment we have. Is it that assignment or there's another one? No, there is that one. That was the first one that you needed to do. And this is going to be the second one because this is the second week of classes. Uh, and, and we only had one assignment to be done until now, which most students completed. And you should do two, Mary. Yeah, um, that's what I wanted to ask. Is it fine since like I did it wrong? Um, can I just redo it? Yeah, of the course you can. Of course you this. can, and I know I know your circumstances, so there is no problem. You can do that, and you get an extension for this. Do not worry about the late submission. Oh, thank you so much. Okay. Sure. Just oh. one more one more comment regarding Urartians and Armenian connection. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Sometimes Rob. that academics uh, tend to um, uh, be against this theory because Urartian was uh, di belonged to a different language family. It was yeah. Uro Urartian family. But when you look at the uh, kings, kings, the names of the kings of Urartu, they are mostly Indo-European, like Argishti, for example. Yeah. What do you think about this? Like, uh, there is a theory that there, there were different tribes in this region, yeah. and one of them actually became the um, uh, uh, became uh, the ancestor of Armenians, like they call it Danai or something, from cl close to the lake one. When yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks. Uh, thank you for the question, Rosa. And I'll, first of all, let me say that I, I'm not a linguist, and uh, this question would probably be better answered by people who study languages. Uh, I'm an artist, right? So the way that I see uh, and the way that I understand what I, what is in front of me, for me, is you know, it is an artistic interpretation. Is the way that I I interpret the, the, the visual, right? So for me, there is no question that Van is the heart of, of uh, and Vaskurakan is the heart of Armenia and Armenia. Yeah, we had Van as well, like the God, yeah. yeah. So um, uh, naturally, because we speak about time that is, that's, that, that is so old, and the only evidence that we actually have is these inscriptions that are left, right? So uh, we can't really have bring forth any other evidence except that, except remains of the castles and, and also the traces of culture in linguistics. That's why I said that linguists will probably better answer your question, but I have no doubt in my mind that there was, uh, of course, there was naturally a movement of people that were coming and going and people were migrating, but Armenians are in, indigenous to this land. And, and to me, the signs, for example, the signs that I showed you, which is Nashanagir, and the fact that they were um, used by Armenians throughout their history, but they count history as far as 10th or 12th millennium BCE, which was way before history even began, right? So if we speak about history and civilization, we usually speak about the first cities and those first cities are, are just around 6,000, 7,000 BC. So uh, that yeah. happened in Jericho, as you know, right? The first erected walls, uh, so the first urban center. Um, we have a history that goes far beyond that, but at least three, 4,000 years. So. Of course, it's not a recorded history, but the remnants are there. And I, I do believe that we're, we are the Urartians and we are uh, the people that lived on this land for this 10,000 years and more. Um, yeah, yeah, there is no doubt, like uh, even DNA um, 
uh, research shows yeah, that right. uh, like the right. Armenians right. are the closest to the people that were discovered like 8,000 years old. There is no doubt that uh, when it comes to DNA, uh, we are like natives. Yeah. But um, I, I just wonder this this language in language part is interesting. Yeah, one theory is that there were different type, ty different kind of tribes in Urartu, then some of them were Indo-European, some of yeah. them were not. Mm -hmm. And actually the, the Armenian language itself was very high, um, has a lot of from Urartian language. Yeah. But yes, this was interesting. Why, how, like, and who, we are forgetting, forgetting Koreans as well. They had, yeah. uh, they, they are, um, well, so um, that, 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 that is interesting for me. Maybe that is the reason why Armenian language is was diff very difficult to identify with Indo-European languages. Mm. Yeah, In the uh, beginning, they, they were thinking. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right, Rosa. But don't forget languages, a language is a living thing. And the language has a tendency to borrow words from, the, from those languages it has a contact with, right? So Armenian, for example, is full of uh, long words from Iranian, uh, Iranian languages. And, uh, and vice versa, they also borrowed words from us. So uh, linguistics are such complicated uh, field. And that's why I would not even dare to go anywhere near that, except of course, say things that sound at least true to me, or maybe my intuition tells me that there is something there, but people were coming and going just like they're coming and going today. And the languages mix just the way yeah. they're mixing today because in Armenian, there are many uh, loan words today that we're using that are borrowed from different languages. And the same thing happened five or 6,000 years ago. So the question of ethnogenesis and the way, where, where did we come from and where Urartu really Armenia or not, to, in my mind, there's no doubt that it, it is the same ethnos, it's the same people that might have spoken. I think this dialect. is widely accepted. That that's true. Like everyone in academics as well, everyone believes that's true. Like um, it's just, okay. a, I was just asking only about the yeah. language. Rosa, great. Thank you for this question. Unfortunately, guys, I got to go because I have another class coming in three minutes and I need to at least uh, end this one. So it was fun. Well, thanks for you. the lecture. And, it uh, was great. Uh, yeah, great. And I'll see my students uh, uh, next week on Monday, okay? Okay, thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.